Everybody, is, as, I'm, as I'm sure everyone has heard, sadly our third speaker is not well. And it's a very great shame because Carl Fisher would have brought uh, just a marvelous counter view to uh, the presentations today from the, the wonderfully scholarly understanding of architectural history that Paul always gives us. And uh, my own view as a, well, actually I'm a landscape architect, but in this issue I must say I'm a partisan on many points. And Carl has a more balanced view from a planning historian's perspective. And um, so um, from his hospital bed, he has sent me this material, which I must read. And it might just take me about uh, four or five minutes. Uh, it's, quite, it's, it's quite a few. But uh, well, we can, you can, if you can, if you don't mind standing there while I do this, Paul. But, uh, and then we will have a conversation between ourselves, perhaps. But um, so what Carl says is, while the Griffin's plan is obviously one in the sequence of great plans of pre-World War I modernism, such as those of Chicago, Helsinki, and Berlin, which were based on the perception of Paris as a model, that is the great axials uh, alignments of Hausmann's Paris, it is almost the only one in which the system of big tree-lined boulevards has really been implemented and built. The buildings are a different matter. <laughs> Let us talk about them later. The experience of the Paris model had enthused people internationally in such a way that they postulated that urban renewal was to take place in the mode of Hausmannization by laying a network of big avenues across the, um, and over, to overcome the smaller scale street patterns. But since in most cities there was no Napoleon the III uh, conferring almost dictatorial powers on two urban designers, the interests of the house owners everywhere meant that such concepts did, did not have much of a chance of being realized. Housemanization remained wishful thinking. Saarinen's plan for Helsinki, now, Mankenyem, but I don't know that anyone can pronounce Finnish here. But it's a marvelous, unique language. But it's a, it's a, um, a new town extension to Helsinki that, that Saarinen did in about 1916. It remained a beautiful scheme to be admired for the skill of its presentation, just as Saarinen's plan for Canberra. Similarly, few of the great avenues of the Burnham plan for Chicago were built as envisaged, let alone Chicago's civic center, the realization of which has never happened. That was a sort of a center of radiating lines on the west side of the city. Looking at these examples, Canberra turns out to be a remarkable exception. The only parallel in which the drawings of the pre-war era did in fact become reality in the 1920s and 1930s is Belaga's plan for the city extension of Amsterdam. In Canberra, Griffin achieved um, to have large essential parts of the skeleton of wide city beautiful avenues to be built because there the task was not one of urban renewal but of greenfield, clean slate, new town planning and because public ownership of land ensured a high level of planning control. But then again, this is where the implementation of the city beautiful aspects of Griffin's plan ended. The associated urban design components in the form of buildings along the street frontages evaporated after World War I. This was a change which was not restricted to Canberra. Almost everywhere, urban design in the mode of early modernism uh, was rejected after World War I in favor of um, mid-century modernism of buildings in space. Worldwide, a range of factors was responsible for suggesting a new pattern. The new ideal included the intention of dissolving the, overcome, the, uh, the over, overly dense city of transforming it into an urban landscape, eliminating the undesired corridor street by replacing buildings along streets as well as perimeter blocks by buildings designed as isolated sculptures in the landscape. In part, this was an almost pathological reaction to the experience of the all too dense European industrial city, a phase of development which Australian cities did not have to go through because they emerged at a later point of time, even though they too were not free of slums. But this way of thinking and the models associated with it nevertheless had their effect outside of Europe too. At the time, it also seemed to make sense for planning to separate the urban functions in such a way that manufacturing would be shifted away from housing and out of the historic centers, which would then be transformed into pure central business districts. People would be able to live in a purely residential district comprising anything from single family homes for those who could afford it to flats and high rise for others, all connected through publicly financed freeways for the private motor car. Only by the 1960s was it becoming apparent that this approach of the city functional was not exactly producing lively, vibrant cities, but on the contrary, it was doing enormous damage to the existing cities and it was an equally non-sustainable practice for greenfield developments. Today we know that 
what I call the early modern city was based on the experience of solid 2,000 years of urban development dating back to Greek and Roman antiquity. The Roman tenement house, the taverns and shops on the ground floor and apartments on the top made for vibrant city life. In contrast to the slabs of modernist housing estates and certainly different to high rises and skyscrapers without a street address and lots of parking spaces causing enormous traffic footprints in unwalkable cities. In 1561, Michelangelo had discovered the aesthetic appeal of the straight street in his Via Appia, and a pope with a slightly incongruous name of Sixtus V had developed an unprecedented system of roads catering for a multiplicity of functions associated with transport, public life, the economy, and aesthetics. When Haussmann cut his avenue through Paris, again with a multifunctional perspective, including traffic, real estate development, sanitation, and military aims, he created this charming urban environment of which Paris is so admired. The true charm of the network of streets and squares and houses, however, lies in a degree of variety which Haussmann had not really aimed for. A close look at Haussmann's achievements reveals that the framework of avenues has in fact remained fragmented. Um, although he had the full-scale support through the dictatorial powers of uh, N N Napoleon Le Petit, not only did he fail to achieve the implementation of a perfectly connected system of avenues, what is more important is that the spaces between the avenues remained largely untouched. It is this feature which provides this enriching contrast between the classic formality of the avenues with bustling street life and the quieter, charming, romantic irregularity of the maze of streets and buildings dating back to all periods between the Middle Ages and the early 19th century. Griffin was well aware of all this and made reference to it. Since he was planning a new city on virgin ground, he could, of course, not resort to the existence of medieval structures. Instead, he combined the classic formality of the city beautiful avenues with elements of romantic garden city character in the quiet areas behind the avenues. Between the radial city beautiful avenues that form the backbone of the system, as he put it, that lie the triangular residential sections. And here's a quote. While secluded, they may yet be but a few steps from the industries and communication lines serving them. Unquote. This is made possible by the, the triangular or rhombic arrangement of their traffic line business uh, boundaries. The relatively massive building blocks associated with the, these also provide shelter from traffic noise as exemplified in the central aerial perspective of the competition plan. Towards the centers of the districts in the Griffin plan, the streets decrease in length, accessibility and importance, thus increasing the proportion of residential land to that of road space and discouraging through traffic. There, away from the avenues, the classical formality of the city beautiful frame, or as Griffin uh, put it, the contrasting dignity and severity in the connecting avenues, gives way to an element of romantic irregularity characteristic of the garden city spirit. In Griffin's own words, quote, the internal blocks, typically large in many cases, forming considerable undivided areas, leave opportunity for private development or small community initiative to evolve pretty schemes of driveway subdivision, recessed courts, closes, quadrangle terraces, common gardens, irregular hill garden subdivision, and a host of similar possibilities, adding incident and variety to a consistent whole. So what, uh, what, what Carl is advocating there is a, a return to the understanding of the avenue as the basis of what Canberra in the 21st century could be, while still conserving the, 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 the suburbs behind the, that framework within the avenue. So that's, uh, that's the point of this uh, long uh, uh, talk. He's also got a poem about this. Now, this is a, a German poem, which I should read in German, but I will, I will not. And it's a very free translation of it. It's by Kurt Tukolsky, and it's called The Ideal, the Ideal Home. He says, uh, written in the 1920s in the Weimar Republic era. It's got a Berlin satirical edge. Yes, that's what you would like, a mansion with park and a wraparound terrace, the ocean in front and a back door in Paris, magnificent views, rurally mundane, and the bathroom view on the Alps, just insane, and the cinema, just a stone throw away. The whole thing's simple and modest and, hey, nine bedrooms, well, why not 20? A roof garden with deep-rooting oak trees aplenty, radio, central heating and a vacuum cleaner operated by servants with impeccable demeanor. A sweet wife full of grace and verve and one for the weekend as a reserve. Um, vibrant culture and yet all round, solitude and not a sound. Uh, so, of course, this is... Uh, Canberra's you know, dream that it wants the solitude and not a sound, it also wants a city. How can it get the two? <laughs> well, so what we thought we might have is a little conversation in lieu of 
the full presentation from Carl Fisher. And we have distributed a paper that he um, published in the Town Planning Review earlier this year, which looks from a strictly planning perspective on the uh, evolution of the planning over, over, the, over a century. But I think if we bring this back to the main theme of the symposium, uh, we can, uh, how, if we sit here, is that, or should we stand up? It's a rather strange with the counter in front of us. I thought we, yes. yes, I think we have to stand up. We have to stand up. Um, we might throw it over to John as the opening speaker to make a few uh, reactions to what has been presented to you. <laughs> mm -mm. Uh, can, thank you, James. Uh, let me just check the time, uh, Anne. How much would we? We've got about 20 minutes, about right? About 20 minutes? Good. So, so this has been really, uh, we have, as James has said, uh, an opportunity now, uh, with the absence of, uh, of Carl, uh, that we wish to, in a sense, continue a, a, a discussion between perhaps Paul and James in the first instance, but perhaps uh, prompted by some thoughts and, and questions that have arisen during the comments after each of their presentations. And, and one of the uh, comments that elicited quite a response from James, of course, was regarding the Griffin legacy, and I don't think we'll go back there at this stage, but, uh, <laughs> but another uh, question had implications in regard to, I think, uh, another work of Aldo Jurgula, and I'd be interested if perhaps we could explore um, uh, some thoughts on, on the Parliament House, which, of course, now occupies the most dominant site, I suppose, in, 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 in the built Canberra era. Um, my own impressions are that it was a mistake to be on that hill, and I was just wondering if we could explore that concept and perhaps what each of the, each of the speakers have thought of that. Paul, would you like to have a go? Yes. <laughs> Please, I'd like to touch that one. Hmm? <laughs> no, I've got too strong a views on this. It's, it's, uh, we, we, need a, we need a balanced approach. <laughs> Does anyone in the, in the, in the audience have a comment on... Ah, on... Oh, yes, we have one here. Here's Stuart, yes. One of, the, one of the criticisms of New Parliament House was that it was privatised, that Old Parliament House, you could bump into people on corridors and they might be cleaners, they might be prime ministers, but the possibility for interaction. It's a bit unfair to slag the entire exercise because if you look at the public spaces, I've known Canberrans who take great delight in jogging over the roof and pissing on Parliament <laughs> House. You could call that Democrats' revenge, but I was thinking of more gracious things like the Marble Hall. I mean, there are places you don't have to pay, you don't have to go to a boutique dinner with the Prime Minister to enjoy in that building. And there are places, you know, and that's not a bad thing. So in a way... It's a ghost of a capital, but if it was supposed to be, I forget what the three things were, but one of them was a meeting place. It is a meeting place. Well, um, just on the idea of the ghost of the capital, I think that, in fact, we, we, we must thank uh, Mitchell Jogler Thorpe for, for, for that, because um, it does establish the scale of what Griffin intended, and you can, and, and you can see it now from, um, you know, it does disappear a little bit in the light because of the silver stainless steel, but nevertheless, you can see it from all sorts of surprising areas, which is part of the uh, terrific axial alignments of, of Griffin's uh, original plan. And so, therefore, it, it does, you know, it, it, it tells us what the center of the, the, center of the, the climax of the idea could have been, and so it's got that quality. I agree with you that there are some actually quite good spaces in uh, Jogler's building. The one that the one that I like, actually, is, it's got a terrible name. It's called the Queen's Terrace. Uh, but that hasn't stopped Canberra calling another terrace after the Queen. I don't know. It's got to draw a line somewhere, haven't we? But we've got a Queen Elizabeth Terrace recently created. Anyway, um, the, um, but on the Queen's Terrace, um, it's got a sort of Schinkel-esque view where you're looking through, through columns, like in the Neues Museum in, in Berlin, and, and, and then look down the axis. I think that that's a very fine uh, spatial uh, experience. And then uh, there's no question that when you're on the top, that exhilaration of, of the avenues coming to that, to that high point. I'm not sure that these days you, are, you can jog over it. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's sort of, I've got a post 9-11 security system now where it takes you, you know, several, you know, an hour to get in. But, but the, um, 
but uh, that for a long time it did have that marvellous sort of Aussie, Aussie uh, view that you could just walk over those blokes, you know. Um, well, I, I can't add anything to it. I'm not from here, and so the, the, the political... Do. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I would simply judge it as uh, 1980s postmodern architecture, and it was the first time I went to it, I thought it was a lot of fun, and all the Otto Wagner revival details in it and all of that. On the other hand, I, it, it, it isn't the strongest piece of postmodern architecture no. one could see, and... Uh, in fact, it's so self-effacing by taking the hill down and then hiding itself with the hill. It, in a sense, that was a very strong aspect of it. So the things you say where you can relive the Griffin plan in your imagination and see the, the, the great diagonals come together and there's the, the ghost of the, uh, of the Capitol building right above you and all that was very exciting the first time I was there. Yeah, yeah. But the idea that the, the political aspect of putting the Parliament House on top of the hill, which is such a complete betrayal of the Griffin plan, um, mm -hmm. You just can't keep out of your mind, no matter what. Even as an American, I must say. It was a long debate, yeah. and um, it was always, in fact, going to be there, I think, from the 60s onwards. Mm. Mm. Chris, uh, you might have some comments. That we I mean, I'll, I'll state my bias. Uh, Aldo is a good friend of mine. I was just with him this morning at a book lunch, but Aldo didn't make the decision to put Parliament no, there. No, and I course. think that building is yeah. probably... The, of global significance would be Sydney Opera House, the Griffin Plan, and, and that building, because in my view, it's quite timeless. Um, and I think it's just like at the Canberra competition, when you sift through all the entries in that Parliament House comp competition, I think the best design won in both cases. That's just my opinion. Well, I can add that in the course that I teach on 20th century architecture, which only lasts one semester and has a very limited number of buildings, it's one of them that I always show. Oh, so. well, there you go. That proves it. In fact, all three of those that Christopher <laughs> mentioned are in that. Yeah. Uh, there was perhaps Diane first. Oh, Diane, sorry. Yes. Uh, are we moving on to another topic? Yes, of course. Yes. Please. Um, I would like to hear your comments on urban vitality. Firstly, as Griffin saw it, and now we, with uh, issues of uh, urban consolidation, etc., where we're still not seeing urban vitality, we have densification, but we still have no one there. You know, who's walking the footpaths? Who's out in the parks and squares? I'd just like to tease out how you envisage through your understanding of, of Griffin, how you saw his design accommodating the vitality, whether he saw it right across the city or what specific parts would be vital and have this people experience. And other places that would be quiet, which I think you alluded to, the living spaces behind the avenues taking on a different character, but where was this vitality? Because I'm hearing people wanting it right across the city everywhere. And I don't think that's what Griffin was wanting. Perhaps you can tease it out for us. <laughs> You're the urban planner. <laughs> oh, not really. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> well, I'm sorry to be monopolizing the conversation. And please, please. please. Um, well, I think that um, there's a marvelous, actually one of the marvelous, I think the best uh, diagram in the Griffin Legacy book is one that I think Stuart McKenzie produced, which is... Um, which shows the tramway network after they got the plans and figured out where the tramway network was and, you know, a five-minute walking distance from the trams and then also with the suburban rail network and perhaps a five-minute or eight-minute walk from the, from the railway stations. And when you sort of do that very simple, unbelievably simple, di you know, diagram of how easy it would be to get around in Griffin's plan of north and south Canberra, um, you can see that the what he called the, you know, uh, main avenues of communication, uh, would have that um, um, role of being natural collectors of people and, and transfer points. And, and they would undoubtedly have been the uh, points at which, uh, you know, a more normal everyday life would have, could have, could have grown. Uh, so take, for example, the idea that the entire bureaucracy, I mean, of, of that era was conceived to be located in the parliamentary zone. And it was served by a tramway network running around the, the triangle. Well, it connected to the suburban network 
at the market center and the civic center. And so, therefore, all of those public, how many thousand public servants did we have? They would all be used commuting through, through those points and running, you know, and, and, and getting to the conventional offices of the day uh, by that means. And so I think that that would have generated the type of street life, which in many ways, I think he imagined as a sort of a simplified and purified version of the Chicago neighborhoods, you know, with their intensity. Now, of course, n next to that, we must put the population of, of Canberra. And, and, of course, uh, the competition called for just the design of a small area. That's, a, that's the original a few square miles to the center. And the idea was to have 25,000 people in that area. It'd be very interesting. I don't know who's ever done that study. How many people live in that area today? Has it ever reached anything like 25,000? But then Griffin never committed himself publicly to the capacity of the rest of his plan. But in the, in the New York Times uh, uh, interview that, that Paul showed, he said 75,000. Now, I've always looked at that and said, well, wait a moment. If, if, if that includes were um, two very low-density suburbs, the agricultural suburbs in Fishwick, which were to, you know, the market gardens for the city initially, and then what Griffin called the society suburb, which was Yarralumna. By that he didn't mean high society. He meant a, a suburb of societies, of associations, of groups who would have like a, a national camp, and it would be uh, like the Chautauqua or, the, or, or those types of places where people went to on Lake Michigan. And so it would be a low-density area. So then if you develop those areas, and if you develop the, uh, there's about 10,000 acres in, in, in Griffin's plan, the original scheme, um, if you develop that to this, the density of Letchworth, of the English Garden City, you would have 120,000 people living in North Canberra and South Canberra. And it's never really got above 80,000. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why the, the, the place has got this fundamental suburban character, quite apart from the new towns of Elkhorn and Woden and so on. So I think that the issue is, is one of population numbers and densities, and the dilemma that has been created by the Y plan is that the motor car city is very difficult, difficult to retrofit. And so um, to introduce uh, corridors of density is highly challenging, particularly when the government doesn't own most of that land, when it's in the private sector now. Or, and, and so the the government, the ACE government, has got greenfield sites which they can realize on and big slabs of land in the center as well. But, you know, they want to sell that for the maximum dollar rather than deal with difficult owners and, you know, betterment charges and things, which, which in fact is a very difficult process. So I think that the problem is, is really multidimensional. But in terms of, of vitality today, I think that, um, rightly or wrongly, what's happened on the ANU exchange is quite interesting. And, and the um, idea of having like a campus town, which is almost, you know, actually it's becoming like an American campus town that people come to, <coughs> come to Canberra to go to university uh, and to have accommodation between the city and the university instead of the, the colleges across against Black Mountain. I, I think that that creates uh, the potential of a lot. All we needed was better architecture. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Well, uh, perhaps I, just, just before coming to Paul, um, it, it's a wonderful question and it's something that reminded me of what James said earlier, and I quote him, that um, uh, uh, after a century we are still discovering new dimensions of, of the Walter Burley Griffin story, and, it, and it's apparent even today after a hundred years that we're still able to tease out and think of, of many ideas that... that perhaps were inherent at the time and we're now beginning to realise. Can I just add to that last question that my experience with both Melbourne and Sydney has been that when the population increases, and I here specifically think of Melbourne city itself, the gridded city of Melbourne, how, how vital and interesting that is now, and, and that almost entirely has been due to an increase in population in the city of several hundred percent. Back in the 50s, those of you can remember that, when Melbourne became the, the location for the end of the world on that film on the beach, it really was a great location for it because Melbourne had very few people living in it. Now, the city is full of residences, full of light at night time and full of activity. And I, 
I, I, I also agree with James that, that really the population density, and, and in some ways it doesn't really matter too much whether it's done in towers or, or low-rise blocks or, or density or, or whatever, <laughs> high-rise blocks. But, but one looks at Paddington, for example, in Sydney, which is one of the most dense uh, living areas in Australia, and Paddington is, is quite an active area, or even King's Cross, the second most dense uh, living area in, in, in uh, Australia, and that has great urban vitality. So I think the link between urban vitality and population is really strong, and that brings the third element of public transport, of course. Paul, perhaps I, we've set a stage for you now that you may be happy oh, to... No, no, no I just was going to... I wanted to ask James a question that we... Um, or just to comment on the fact that it's, we're so concentrated on the Canberra plan, and you're talking about the Canberra plan. Is there anything to be learned from Griffin's other plan? I mean, nothing ever gets mentioned of Leeton or Griffith or Mossmain, and yet here's the same figure. If, he, if, if the two of them put this together in 1911, didn't they have anything more to offer us, or is this a one-time, a one-shot thing? Well, that's a marvelous question. Um, I, I think that... Um, the other, in, in fact, those um, irrigation towns uh, are really quite fascinating, and in particular, Leeton. I think Leeton has a has a scale that is uh, quite um, beautifully human scale. Um, of course, none of them have uh, ever grown in any way like uh, like Canberra, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think that without the uh, symbolic driver of the program of the Canberra Australian Federal Capital Competition, I think the other plans do somewhat tend to become pattern-making exercises. And they might be responsive to the site, of course, as we'd expect from Griffin, but they don't seem to be charged with that special energy. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, quite uh, dramatically here in Canberra itself, because in the middle of World War I, Griffin got caught up in a very controversial scheme to build an arsenal city and so there is a Griffin plan for the Tuggeranong Valley. Um, it has some uh, amazing sweeping curved elements, uh, but at the same time, it has an air of un true, true unreality about it, I think. Um, and so I, I think that the, um, the, the basis of the Griffin um, solution to the competition really did come out of the long 19th century Beaux-Arts tradition of how you do a competition. You know, how do you read the program and how do you take the requirements and organize them in a symmetrical hierarchical way and do uh, sections and elevations and uh, you do it in a esquisse in eight hours. And so I think that there was that type of um, thinking, which Marion, of course, was, had, had come through at MIT which was a thoroughly Parisian-based education with, with, with professors from, uh, from Paris. And Griffin, from his more German-based education, based education in, uh, in, uh, at University of Illinois, uh, uh, has this uh, technical basis. Of course, the, the, the plan then fuses that Beaux-Arts organization of the Constitution. It's, it's really the Australian Constitution turned into buildings. But then that's fused with the lake, the lake system, the water recycling system, the tramway system, the, the, the railway system, uh, the urban forestry, the urban horticulture. That's Griffin's thinking. And so I think there's a, it truly is a, a combined effort. For a long time, it was only said to be Griffin's plan. We have found evidence, you know, a number of commentators at the time, Griffin himself acknowledging Marion's in, in contribution. So I think that these days, uh, quite unabashedly, we call it the Griffin's plan. Um, but... Uh, who did what, of course, is difficult to sort out. But it was that, just that moment of creativity, just married, and, 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 and uh, it's a, quite a good time in life, generally speaking, and, 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 uh, and, and ideas and opportunity, and you can feel it. I mean, if, I don't know how many of, of our audience here have come to Canberra just today or whatever, but you must go to the National Archives to see the, the exhibition. And... When you see the drawings, you, must, you realize they must have known they could win. It's just got the feeling, we're winning this, you know, as they, as they draw it. It's got that, uh, everything coming together at that time. Mm. I think that stands out from, from, from Moss Main and other things, yeah. yes. Mm. Yeah.
Ben. Uh, I just wish to point out, sorry, I was, I've had the mic before. Mm. I just want to point out one sort of, uh, uh, tr mm. one, yes. one sort of trite detail. Talking about Parliament House, how it relates to the people. In Canberra, we have a lot of sailors, and sailors around the world use what you call burgies, which are land-based or, or based on the sailboat. They are wind um, direction indicators. Now, on top of Parliament House, there is the world's largest and most appreciated burgee. <laughs> there it is. No, I think that that part of it, the, again, um, talking about how to win a competition, you know, it's, a, it's an art in itself. But um, if you look at the way Jogler entered the competition, the competition brief is a two-volume A4 uh, material with the Australian flag on the cover. And so they just, took, they just took the cover of the competition brief and put that up there and said, uh, we'll win with this. <laughs> we, have, we have two other questions. David first and then over to the... I, ju I just wondered if there's any information about the actual adjudication committee which delivered uh, Bertie Griffin to us. And do you think they may have imagined some of those things that you were... Oh. You want to have a go at that? <laughs> we, we, we need more questions for, for Paul. Well, again, terrific question. And a lot more scholarship has been done. Christopher Vernon has done some and others. And uh, the fourth man has, has come to the fore in the adjudication committee. So the adjudication committee was three people. John Kirkpatrick who was the architect for the Commonwealth Bank, and he designed the Money Box building in Sydney on Martin Place in the corner of Pitt Street. John Montgomery Cohn, who was really an irrigation engineer, and James Alexander Smith, who was a mechanical engineer, really a railway engineer. In fact, James Alexander Smith loved Griffin's railway scheme. That's how he won in many ways. Um, but there was a fourth man who was the secretary of the competition. And I think David Heaton and, and Christopher have highlighted his significance. His name was Inglis Clark. What's his first name? I've forgotten. His, he, he was the son of Inglis Clark, the writer of the Constitution. And he was named for a, a transcendentalist philosopher, whose name will come to me in a moment. And, um, and his father it was in Tasmania. Uh, he was the attorney general and then a j judge in, in Tasmania. And he, his father was com communicating with um, the um, progressive thinkers of, the, of New England. And um, his son uh, was a qualified architect, and he went to the United States, and um, he, uh, he lived first in Irving Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the home of E.E. E. Cummings, Family, the E. E. Cummings, the poet, that's it, anyway. Uh, and, and, and he worked for Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge. Then uh, he went to New York and worked with McKim, Mead, and White. This is all in the period round about 1905 to 1909. And so we had uh, an Australian totally imbued through his family, one would think, with what the Australian Constitution was about, plus this understanding of American progressive philosophies and, and religious views, plus working with the great Alphases, the descendants of Richardson, and with their long Beaux-Arts tradition of, of more recent times. And so, um, the, uh, undoubtedly, he was a player, I think, in, in, the, in making the decision. Mm. Conway. Conway, yes. Conway, mm. English Clark. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, we have one more question. I think it'll have to be our last because we are catching up with time, Anne. Yes, Thank you please. very much, for a, to all of you, for a fascinating afternoon. Two related, well, not necessarily related things. Just the difference between landscape architecture and urban planning uh, in respect of, and the, the follow on from that, um, in relation to public transport, the very fast train. Where would Griffin have put the terminal in the city? Oh, good question. 
<laughs> All right, now, Paul, do you want to have a go at landscape architecture and urban planning? Mm -mm. Oh. Well, I, I... You can tell the University of Illinois story and, <laughs> and how they brought both into the faculty, perhaps. Um, anyway... Well, you tell that story. I don't know what story that is. They well, got I know the Harvard moment. story, but, you know, yeah. you, you tell us your story, Paul. <laughs> no, I didn't have a story. I just commented that, uh, that urban planning was not a subject right. in 1900, mm -hmm. that, that we didn't have that phrase. And, and landscape architecture was, uh, was a phrase, but it meant what we think of as a modern a landscape architect. What it seems to me is that Griffin himself incorporated urban planning and landscape architecture, as we know them, into the phrase that I am a landscape architect. He didn't mean that he pick the trees that went next to the house, but that, that the, the planning of how the city fits into the landscape is landscape architecture. It's the architecture of working with landscape. So that's why he called himself architect and landscape architect. But in those two phrases are all three of the disciplines that we now have separated into three separate disciplines. So he considered himself all three of those. But that would be quite a singular interpretation of what landscape architecture was. In, but, but yet Griffin used singular words all the time in that kind of, and the way he named streets and all of that. So it fits right together. I, but I think that's how we have to see his letterhead that says architect, landscape architect. Yes, Paul is absolutely right. I mean, what's happened in the 20th century is the specialization of professions, which has been a terrible mistake. But um, in, in the 19th century, in the American scene, um, the making of those American parks, Central Park and the great park systems of Boston and Chicago and Buffalo and many of the other cities, they were initiated by Frederick Law Olmsted and his office and his sons carried on the work. And um, that level of thinking of how um, great urban sp public spaces, essential for an urban population, were integrated with what was transforming the city, the infrastructure, particularly the water supply and sewerage, but also the railways. And so how to seize the moment when those big engineering works are done to also make a park around that reservoir, you see, which is what, in fact, Central Park is. And so th there is that uh, I idea of shaping the city in the 19th century landscape tradition in, in the United States. In, in Great Britain, uh, town planning emerged as, a, 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 as the first discipline and landscape came second. And so, for example, here in Australia, our planning tradition really comes to us from Liverpool. And Liverpool was a course in civic design and it had brought in landscape architect Thomas Mawson and others as part of that education. And so when Dennis Winston came and started teaching uh, town planning at Sydney University, he invited landscape architects to go and teach the planners and he invited Lindsay Pryor, the great uh, uh, plantsman and forester and, and, and uh, botanist, uh, to teach uh, landscape architecture to the planners at Sydney University. So there is a inter very interesting professional, uh, professional links in that way. I think that what's happening to in today's world is that all of those uh, professional distinctions are, 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 are blurring. And, uh, what is needed is this understanding of the physical form of the city combined with the socioeconomic shapers of the city and how, how the two interact. And, uh, and that's a huge educational challenge. And uh, it's, um, it, 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 the separation has led to a lot of the current issues with uh, modern cities. Uh, the, 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 la the last part of your question was it, where would we... Or where oh, yes, oh, the very fast train. This is oh, very yes, fast yes. train. Oh, he would have put it where Griffin put it. That, uh, he put it in the first place. Uh, that, that is, demolish Russell and, uh, and put the railway station where it should be. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I, I think that's a wonderful idea. I hope there's no one here from Russell, by the way. And look, I, I think really that brings us to a close. We, uh, we, on the demolition of Russell, do you think? We, we, uh, we have, uh, I, I think, more than, uh, more than compensated for, for Carl's uh, absence, and I hate to say that because nothing against Carl, but in many ways the discussion has been most enlightening, and, and certainly to those of us who have a great interest in the Griffins and in Canberra, I think it, it, it indicates that there is a lot of discussion yet to be had, and that the best thing we can hope for is that these sorts of discussions continue. Uh, the worst thing is when those secret committees, I think, that you mentioned, uh, James, uh, separate themselves from 
this symposium type activity and make decisions which we find out about later on. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I was going to make some comments about the, uh, the talks of each, each of our presenters, but I think at this time there, there really isn't much else other than to, uh, to thank the speakers, and, and I'm going to do that and ask you to show your appreciation for their time.